forgot the intro. Um, as you all know, lakes are a really important ecological as well as economic driver, especially at the local municipality level. Um, and Bantam Lake is just one example of the, the way lakes are used year round. Uh, they're used for a, a variety of recreational opportunities. And, uh, and Bantam Lake is a relatively special lake because of its size and its location. But, um, and it does have its fair share of issues. And so it's a pretty good example of what the type of things that, um, that uh, lakes in Connecticut generally face on an annual basis. So Bantam Lake is located in the northwest corner of the state of Connecticut. It's part it's found within the Chapag River watershed uh, watershed and it, which is also part of the Mississippi River, River watershed basin. Uh, Bantam Lake is um, found within um, found within four towns uh, in uh, and it has a um, it has Apologize, folks. I'm having some technical issues up here. I'm seeing one slide in front of me, but uh, you guys are seeing something different. So sorry about that. Let's make sure we're on the same page. It'd be nice if I'm talking while you guys are seeing the same slide. Um, We'll, um, I'll do a little song and dance. <laughs> Forgot my top hat tonight, so sorry about that. Uh, anyways, and if I had, I'd pull a rabbit out of it. Um, so, so Bantam Lake is located in the northwest corner. It's got about a, a 20,000 uh, acre watershed uh, size in total. Uh, it's in four towns. There are four smaller water bodies within this uh, within the watershed um, that also get widely used for recreation. Um, and uh, and and so uh, it's yep we're getting there one more slide down great it has a lot of wetlands throughout it rather extensive wetlands that um, are herbaceous and shrubby and forested wetlands which all of these things are really important especially when we start talking about the nutrient dynamics within the watershed some of these some of these uh, uh, features are going to have a, a big impact on capturing. Uh, nutrients as well as uh, possibly even leaking some of those nutrients. Um, so we'll have the next slide. Uh, the land use within Bantam uh, River watershed is quite extensive. It's mostly uh, mostly forested, but there is an increasing uh, dominance of commercial and residential um, in the in the watershed as we all see every day. So next slide. Bantam Lake is the largest natural lake in the state of Connecticut at about 950 acres in surface area. Uh, its bathymetry is similar to most glacial origin lakes in the state of Connecticut in which it has steep sides all around it but a relatively flat bottom. Um, it's, only tw it's only 20, or excuse me, it's only 25 feet at its maximum depth, so it's a relatively shallow lake, about seven to eight meters, average depth being about 14 and a half feet. Um, and uh, that puts us, when we think about the total watershed size to a ratio of the surface area of the lake, we're talking about a 20 to 1 ratio. That's a big watershed. Even though we have a large lake, that's a big watershed. So it means that we're going to have a lot of contributions of nutrients and other factors that eventually come downstream and collect in Bantam Lake. Uh, the thermal stratification that we see in Bantam Lake at the deepest section, this is in center, it's kind of washed out, and I do apologize for that, uh, is that it's a typical lake in the fact that the warm water settles at the top and the cold water settles at the bottom. That black line that goes across the, goes through that graph is the thermocline, so as you're working your way down through the water column, there you, with the warm water at the top and the cold water at the bottom, there is sort of an inflection point that occurs, and that's what that thermocline is. You'll see that uh, that thermocline is quite variable in this, in Bantam Lake. It moves up and down, especially early in the season. Generally settles in at around six, uh, five and a half, six meters in depth, and then eventually, in late August, roughly in late August, the lake tends to mix. And we just mixed a few days ago, or a few weeks ago, excuse me. 
Um, and so that's basically when the entire water strata uh, tends to uh, become all fairly similar to each other. The density of the water is quite similar. Now, as a result of this thermal stratification, we often see an anoxic region of the bottom of the lake forming as early as uh, May. And it stays down there for an extended period of time, well beyond four to six weeks. It goes for well, maybe 10, 12, 16 weeks in length. And as that time is occurring, uh, the uh, nutrients are coming out of the bottom of the lake, the sediment. And so we do, and, and because the lake is so shallow, we often will see, and the thermocline is so variable, we will often see that nutrients sort of pumping up into the upper water, upper waters of the, of the water column. And we see, and we see cyanobacteria blooms throughout the whole season. Next slide. And so the Secchi depth uh, is, and the water turbidity is very much affected by this. And so what we often see is a, is a very typical pattern every season. We see that uh, water can be as clear as three and a half meters, if not deeper, early in the season. And by, ju by July, we often see uh, secchi transparency or secchi depth going way up near the surface. Uh, so it goes to around a meter, sometimes less. And so we can, we can experience when we have those types of cell concentrations in the upper water column, we can often see uh, scum formation along the surface and, and then eventually concentrating uh, up against certain shorelines. And so that's what it sort of looks like in July, August, September, and, uh, and right now. Um, we get this really turbid water condition throughout the upper water column. And this was a, a photo of a, of, a, of a bloom that had occurred in 2016. We'll have the next. And in 2016, the bloom was so intense and so sustained for such a long period of time that we actually had to close the entire lake for the first time because of uh, guidelines that were implemented by the Connecticut Deep and DPH, and rightfully so. I mean, these cyanobacteria do emit toxins that can, that can hurt people, that can hurt domestic pets, they can kill you if, you're, if it's the wrong toxins. And so we do have to warrant, uh, it was a warranted closure. The entire lake was closed. Now, the implications of this are much more profound than just simply the impediment or the inconvenience of impacting the recreational aspects that happens in that season. In the town of Morris, the local residents who live around the lake only represent 3% of the total, the total tax base of the town, the total property owners in the town. They pay 37% of the total town budget annually. So this has huge impacts on property value, local tax base, and then the types of activities that can occur in the local municipalities. You'll see this happening quite a bit in many of our rural towns and that have small tax bases where there's, an, where there's essentially a huge division between waterfront home prices and the local municipality tax base. So these issues impact lots and lots of lakes throughout Connecticut uh, because of nutrient loading. Next. We also have our fair share of invasive aquatic plants. Woohoo! <laughs> it's you gotta you gotta love them because they're just they're 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 out there and they're growing all the time and then you gotta get out there in a the canoe and just start mapping them out hand pulling them, suction harvesting them, herbiciding them to the to never end. Um, we do have a few success stories in Bantam Lake. We've been, we've been really interacting with uh, our invasive plants over the past 15 years. And so water chestnut was documented uh, for the first time in about 2008, 2009. Total of two plants were observed. We hand pulled them. And since then, we have not seen water chestnut in the lake. It still threatens our lake, obviously, because they can grow there. But we haven't seen them since. So, I put a great big eradicated sign on the bottom of it because I'll take any success I can take on that plant. We've had relatively decent success with controlling Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pond weed uh, in the lake uh, through herbicide treatments over the past 14 years. We've started to see our native plant beds starting to become much more robust. We've seen uh, native plant diversity becoming much uh, increasing over the past 14 years. So we consider that we've got these plants under control, but we are not out of the woods yet. We still have a lot of work to do. And unfortunately, fanwort has made its way down through the Connecticut River and it started to enter the lake. And we are trying to figure out what our options there. We know that there are some herbicides. 
we unfortunately this plant is also being found in some of our most <coughs> unfortunately the, some of our most pristine native plant beds that we have left in, in Bantam Lake they're quite beautiful and uh, going through them I mean, they're, they're just really wonderful things and that's what makes Bantam Lake such an important fishery because these places have lots of juvenile fish recruitment so um, but um, but but Fanward has made it in so we're gonna have to start tackling that that beast uh, to the best of our abilities so as you can tell we have a lot of potential management issues on every year and they're very dynamic cyanobacteria the entire phytoplankton community in a lake can change literally in two weeks it can change simply because the, the wind came in from a different direction the sun the, te the ambient temperature went up <laughs> it can change for any reason. It can change because someone farted in the wrong direction across the surface of the lake. I mean, it's, it happens so fast, it's ridiculous. And, and so cyanobacteria is exceptionally dynamic. On top of that, you have invasive plants that need to be controlled. And so you have to communicate this with your stakeholders often, if not weekly, at least bi-weekly. And so we are constantly struggling with how do we take this complex myriad of issues, some of which just sound like blah, 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 blah to most people, and so that they can actually understand it. Make informed recreational decisions for themselves and for their family, because that's the most important thing they want to know. Is it safe to go swimming? Is it safe to go water skiing? That's the kind of question they want to answer for themselves. So next slide. So we developed, after 2016, because of that closure, that was a significant event, we developed a smartphone app and a website called Bantam Lake Cyanos, in which we, um, and we've published this uh, app to uh, Android and Apple or iPhone uh, platforms, and, and we update this information on a bi-weekly basis. Next slide. So what we do is we take a lot of that information and we distill it down to icons because, well, let's be honest with each other, people really don't know how to communicate with words anymore. They only know how to communicate through pictures. So that's what we've done here. So we have a, we have a traffic light symbol here, right? So we've got, we've got red, yellow, green, and that basically means green meaning safe to go for your recreational activities. Yellow means there's some sort of advisory that you should be concerned about. You might want to alter your decision making are the types of recreational activities that you decide to do, and red, you need to be real careful. And so this kind of sets up the sort of the logic in people's minds that before they do those recreational choices, it's kind of like looking at a weather forecast. The question in their mind might be, can we go swimming this week? Uh, maybe we should go fishing instead. That's the kind of thing. We don't want to drive people away from the lake. We just want them to sort of think ahead of time rather than just sort of showing up and finding out that the lake is green and that they can't do the activity or it's not really that safe anymore. We also do provide some data, we have to, and that is that we do provide a table of information that sort of describes the, 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 the attributes that most intrigue us about the, the conditions of the lake, the fact that it is changing, and sort of the prediction or sort of trends that are, that are going to likely occur over the next couple of weeks <coughs> when we do the visitation again. Um, and then our limnologist provides a brief synopsis, a briefly worded synopsis. And um, it's hard to get limnologists to be brief, but that's what has to happen. So we get our limnologist to be brief and uh, to describe what's actually happening out there on the lake. Again, very dynamic systems, because you can go from a, a, a green condition to a yellow condition just in two weeks. So, so the number of people that have utilized our app is it's quite popular in the Bantam Lake area. But, and it, and it keeps growing. Everyone's downloading the app. A lot of people are using it. Everyone's talking about it now, so that's, that's a good thing. It's been, we launched it in 2017, and, and in the first year, um, we've had lots of people visiting the app. And this graph basically shows if somebody took out their cell phone and just simply opened the app that day. That's all it really says. And, and as you can see, there is sort of a broad trend that early in the season, when we launched it to the latter portion of the season, it sort of comes down. It makes sense that that's happening. But I think the most important part of this whole, this whole graph is that we never had a day with zero visits. It was visited every day by at least one person every single day. And, and that was the first year. So we're now in our third year of, of this app and maintaining it the websites, and, um, and we're finding that it's, it's, quite, it's quite useful. People are using the information. 
to make their own recreation choices. Um, so those are the, back in 2017, we had 159 downloads. It's probably up to about 120, 225. Um, with about five, that's about 500 homes around Bantam Lake. So that's roughly 50%. And um, what we also can do is we've encouraged people to do a little scum spot. They're not going to the local bar and looking for scum. They're going <laughs> to the local beach and they're looking for scum. So remember, cyanobacteria are buoyant. They can, they can regulate their own buoyancy throughout the water column, so they can go up to the surface of the water. And with a gentle breeze, they can get pushed up and sort of concentrate against one shoreline. And as a result, you can get this sort of spilled paint look across the surface of the lake along one shoreline. That unfortunately could, could increase or increase the, the, the toxin amount, the amount of toxins, concentrating the toxins in this, in this area. And so what we ask our, our, our app users to do is upload pictures of scums and send them to us. And, and we can tell when things happen because I can, get, I can get a bunch of phone calls, I can get a whole bunch of pictures all within six hours of the first, first sighting. So it's really quite impressive how quickly people are uploading the information to us. My next project with my students was to develop a, um, <clears throat> a much more inclusive website that really gets across the, the importance of all the recreational opportunities that we have <coughs> at, uh, at Bantam Lake. And that uh, was a, 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 a website that we developed called mybantamlake.org. And uh, this includes not just the cyanobacteria reports and the, the limnological reports, but we're also including things like field guides and, uh, and the type of activities that you can participate with and the, the, the various organizations and partners that are part of the Bantam River and Lake watershed. We're trying to get people to start recognizing that there's a wealth of opportunity and a wealth of, because people have a tendency to get kind of segmented in their life. And, and, and this is, this is one, one potential way to just get them to recognize all the potential opportunities. So the next page is the field guide. So we have a field guide page for all the fish that you might find. So the fishermen can actually see what fish they're catching when they pull them up on the boat. We have, the, we have winter birds in the winter and summer birds in the summer. And these are relatively simple uh, field guides, but it gets people quick information if they're looking for what's going on in Bantam Lake, what's this plant, what's this animal, if they're interested. And with that, I'll take any questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, so Gene, I'm going to bring up your presentation. <coughs> <laughs> 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 I hope not. <laughs> 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 <